Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the MEXPRA and Swinton Astronomical Society. All you visitors from all the corners of the world that we've got tonight, but I don't know how many. <laughs> this evening's talk reviews astronomical history from ancient Greece to the modern day. It features some of the giants of astronomy who, fur who furthered our knowledge of cosmology by standing on the shoulders of giants before them and takes a look at their observational equipment. It also highlights some unsung heroes with whom, without whom we would not have developed our current understanding of the universe. So the speaker himself, Ian Hargreaves, Hargreaves, sorry. Ian first became interested in astronomy when he witnessed a huge fireball on Christmas Eve in 1965 and wondered what he had just witnessed. After a search lasting over 50 years, he finally tracked it down to have been the Barwell meteorite that landed north of Coventry. Ian Hargraves is a STEM ambassador and was elected a Fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society in 2021 for his astronomical work in the community. He is currently chairman of the Mid Kent Astronomical Society. So if everybody can please put their hands together and give a warm welcome to Ian Hargraves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just make sure I get this right. And you should all be seeing my shared screen now. Lovely. Yep. Okay. Yes. So <clears throat> this is, uh, as was said, is my, it, it's a review of what's got us to way, where we are now, understanding ast astronomy and cosmology. But it's my own personal review. And so some people that I mentioned maybe wouldn't be included by other people and vice versa. And I'll look at their telescopes uh, to some extent and then go on to look at uh, the later telescopes as well. Um, and I hope you're going to enjoy listening to it as much as I did writing it. And if it would change screen, uh, that's not good. <laughs> It's not going to the next slide, I'm afraid, chaps. Ah, now it has. Right. OK, so what was the first thing that we used? Well, obviously, it was the Mark I eyeball, as I call it. And actually, the eyeball is, is quite a, an incredible device. Um, and it's a very fast um, optical system. Um, and it's got what it's, we call dark adaption. So all of these things help um, to let us see a lot more detail than we would normally be able to see if we give the eye enough chances, as we all know. So how do we do that? We use averted vision. And what does averted vision do? It places the image of the object on the back of the retina or on the front of the retina, but the back of the eye. Um, away from the central region uh, of the eye where they're in the center there's main, mainly cones and they're not as sensitive they're the color um, uh, receptors and round the outside are the uh, rods which are the black and white receptors and we have about 120 million rods and 6 million cones in our eye um, so it's about 126 million pixel camera, this is, the human eye, um, and that's still a lot better than any of our um, camera phones or even DSLRs. Yeah, it's not, not right, okay. So <clears throat> with just the human eye, very dark skies, obviously, back in those days, no electric light, just the odd candle, probably. And some very clever thinkers of the period, a lot was deduced about the universe. Um, it could be argued that the very first cosmologists were Aristotle and Aristarchus. Aristotle's geocentric model of nine crystal spheres, plus a prime mover on the outside, was preferred and was then later refined by Ptolemy 
some 250 years later. But Aristarchus was nearly lynched for suggesting at that time that the sun was at the center of the universe. Um, Ptolemy, who lived in Alexandria, where he wrote the Elmagest, which is the great treatise on uh, astronomy, uh, he wrote it around 150 AD, and this introduced the concept of epicycles to explain the retrograde motion of the uh, planets. So we're starting to build up here, people building on other people's ideas, which is basically the, the uh, theme of my talk. And then we, we've got, we're using the, what I call the Mark II eyeball, because this is the eyeball plus some very clever uh, and very uh, accurate instrumentation as well, um, used by Tycho Brahe. Um, and this came after Nicholas Copernicus, who around 100, uh, 1510 proposed a new heliocentric sun-centered model. So Tycho then, or Tycho Bra, as I've um, now understood it should be pronounced, it was still using the Mark I eyeball, but with the help of this very, very large mural quadrant, uh, uh, which was a long sighting tube attached to a huge prot protractor. And that really pushed the human eyeball to its limit in the late 1500s to produce extremely accurate orbital data for Mars. His apprentice, Johannes Kepler, then used that data um, to determine his laws of planetary motion in 1609 and 1619. <clears throat> then, of course, we come to Galileo. And as we all know, Galileo Galilei was the first to use a telescope to observe the heavens. Or was he? There's some doubt about that now. But uh, that's the popular myth anyway, that he was the first to use it to look at the heavens. Um, but it does seem certain that Galileo was the first to point one skywards and describe what he saw in 1610. And as we know, uh, he had the, um, the uh, orbits of the moons around Jupiter. He saw those. He, produced very detailed drawings of them. Um, and these are some of Galileo's original drawings from his sidereal messenger of March 1610 and some later papers. They show the moon, its phase of Venus and its varying size, Saturn and sunspots on the rotating sun. Um, and that all helped to prove that Copernicus had indeed been correct a hundred years previous with his heliocentric model. And, and just before I go on to Roma, that he, as we all know, he was only pardoned about 20 years ago by the Pope, who, because the Vatican had wanted to um, throw him in jail and all sorts of things uh, because uh, of what he was saying about the earth not being the center of the universe anymore. But then, Ole Roma, um, he actually worked to, to, to use the, the, the um, moons of Jupiter to actually calculate the speed of light, which at that time, before then, had been thought as infinite. But by timing the occultations of Io by Jupiter, uh, Roma proved that the speed of light was actually finite. Um, and he presented a paper in uh, November 1676 to the Royal Academy in Paris, um, but he forgot to tell them what his actual calculated speed for the speed of light was. Um, but when they went back over it, people have looked at it and, and done the calcs. It does turn out that it was about 220,000 kilometers per second. So only about 27% low. Uh, and um, but he showed it was actually definitely um, finite. 
It turns out that Roma's error was mainly due to the inaccuracy in the known size of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Uh, and it took another 189 years for Maxwell to determine that the speed of light in the vacuum of space is the accepted figure now 299,792 kilometers per second. So that was pretty good going um, for uh, you know, somebody back then in, 70, not in 1676 to get that accurate. And these are some of his uh, observations of Io showing how, how he was um, using the emergence of Io from behind Jupiter to actually work out the speed of light. And the way he did it, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but it was that he knew when Io should appear from the back of, from round behind Jupiter. And he knew that over a period of time. And then what he saw was when the Earth was nearest to Jupiter, the uh, Io appeared uh, ahead of schedule. And when, he, when the Earth was around the other side of the sun almost and further away from Jupiter, Io was late. And by doing the calculations, he came up with his uh, figure for the speed of light. And then, of course, Isaac Newton, uh, in 1687, he published his Principia, um, which mathematically proved what Kepler had deduced about planetary orbits from uh, Tycho Brahe's eyeballed observations 50 years earlier. Um, and it was Isaac Newton who's credited with saying, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So he was very magnanimous in, uh, I mean, he was obviously a very, very clever fellow. Um, but uh, yeah, he gave all the, all of his predecessors due credit. Um, but not only was he one hell of a mathematician, he was uh, also a half decent telescope maker. Um, in 1668, just one year after the Principia was published, he designed a new type of reflecting telescope. And that was to prove that glass lenses were the source of color fringing chromatic aberration in all the refractors of the day. He developed what we now call the Newtonian reflector. Um, and this eliminated refraction, used that reflection only, which got rid of the chromatic aberrations. Um, this telescope, his second, is on display at the Royal Society. It's really worth going to have a little look at it, uh, along with the other things in the Royal Society. But the mirrors were made of speculum, which is a metal alloy that can be highly polished, but it tarnishes quickly. So they had a few problems with that, as you'll see a bit later on. So then we come on to um, William Herschel's telescopes. And um, he, they were, he, him, aided by his sister Caroline, started searching the skies for nebulae using a selection of reflectors that Herschel made himself. He was also a professional telescope maker and made ever larger telescopes, which helped him detect and describe the nebula in more detail, nebulae, sorry, in more detail. Um, he discovered Uranus in 1781, and later two of its moons plus two of Jupiter's moons. And the Herschels between them discovered 2,500 nebulae. And again, a, a, a accredited to William Herschel, and I don't know whether you can see this, but it's on my teacup here. I have looked further into space than any human being did before me. And I think it's fair to say that Herschel gave birth to aperture fever, as we shall see on the following slides. So, not content with a 12 inch, uh, 6 inch, 12 inch telescope, he decides he's going to have a four foot aperture, 40 foot long reflector, which he completed in 1787. 
Uh, it wasn't terribly um, user friendly, as you can see, you know, all sorts of cranes and winches um, to allow him to uh, look at uh, different declinations uh, in, in the night sky. Um, the, he, he presented his first thousand discoveries that he made with this and these other telescopes to the Royal Society in 1786. And the Herschel General Catalogue of Nebulae and Stars was eventually published in 1864 by his son, John. This included a drawing of H1622 or M51, which attracted the attention of William Parsons, as we shall see next. The Herschel catalogue was later edited and added to by John Dreyer and published in 1888 as the new general catalogue, abbreviated NGC, containing 7,840 deep sky objects. So this is where we get our NGC numbers from. So moving on a little bit further, um, jo Joseph von Fraunhofer. Now, you're all probably familiar with the Fraunhofer lines in the spectrum from the sun uh, and uh, things like that. And it was Joseph von Fraunhofer that discovered them and that's why they have his name. But he is also famous for an invention that not many, that sorry, that many astronomers now take for granted. He actually invented the German equatorial man, mount, which he first developed for the great Dorpstadt refractor. Um, and Struve used this instrument to measure over 3000 double stars to a precision of better than one arc second. And the advantage of this was that he had a clockwork drive. So the clockwork drive, they could control the rate of. So the telescope would then track across the sky without having to um, change uh, altitude uh, uh, and uh, azimuth um, as you were, did have to before. So they, they were able to start making some very, very good measurements because the thing was actually tracking the night sky. So next time, whenever you set up your modern gem mount, you need to doff your cap to this German scientist and optical engineer. Uh, brilliant guy. So the big debate at the time uh, was between Herschel and Parsons. William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, about whether the, uh, all the nebulae that Herschel had described were actually gaseous or whether they might contain stars. And as you see on the screen there, um, William um, Parsons believed that they were probably made up of very, very fine stars that no telescopes of the day could actually resolve them as individual stars. So he then built the Leviathan, um, which was a six foot F9 reflector. And he built this between 1842 and 1845. And he was very proud of his telescope and that he kept two speculums that he always kept highly polished so that when he wasn't using one of them, the other one was in the workshop and he had his guys beavering away, polishing it up um, so that he could always get the best views of his target objects. Um, and in, in 1850, he presented a paper to the Royal Society and he went into a lot of detail about his telescope before he even started to explain the observations he made with it but what impressive observations they were. So this is from just before 1850. And I, you know, to see that amount of detail in M51 with the naked eye, that is pretty good. We're pushing, with our telescopes now, I think we, we'd be pushing that. Well, in fact, with my telescopes, uh, which is an 11 inch, I don't think I could see as much detail as that. And uh, that's with modern lenses and mirrors. But uh, 
yeah, I'm sure that you'll recognize the Whirlpool Galaxy um, and uh, 51 Messier, as it was called at that time, uh, rather, rather than M51. So it's uh, changed slightly the, the way they, they refer to it. But um, interestingly, Lord Ross never mentioned seeing any color in M51 which is certainly there in reasonably long exposure photographs. So even with a 72 inch aperture scope, it looks like it's difficult to see color in many DSOs. Therefore, I guess the camera option has to be the cheaper and certainly the most portable. So moving on from there, we come to Henrietta Swan. Now, Henrietta was uh, profoundly deaf uh, and um, it was noted by her bosses that she did, had very very little to distract her as she get, kept on working on all of these plates that she was uh, being sent from the Bruce telescope um, down in uh, Peru I think it was um, and uh, she she noticed that a straight line, and I quote, a straight line can readily be drawn among each of the two series of points corresponding to maxima and minima, thus showing that there is a simple relation between the br brightest of the variables and their periods. But how did, how did she separate the difference in apparent brightness due to the distance of the star from intrinsic brightness of the CFID? So the CFIS, the, the distance to the CFIS that she discovered had never been measured. Well, it was, in my opinion, that was a stroke of pure genius. Because all she did was assume that all the stars in the Magellanic clouds were at the same distances. And from then on, 1908, the first standard candle had been born. And this is just a picture of the Bruce telescope where the plates were taken that um, Henrietta Leavitt uh, discovered the, the CFID relationship. Um, now, moving on a little bit further, uh, Arthur Eddington. Um, and um, in 1919, Eddington was one of the few, sorry, before I get there, Eddington was actually one of the very few scientists of the day that understood Einstein's equations. He traveled to the island of Principe in May during the 1919 total solar eclipse to prove that the mass of the sun did curve space time according to Einstein's general re relativity predictions of 1915. The weather was poor, but one plate when developed showed a change in apparent position of a star in the Hyades, which agreed with Sir Einstein's prediction. Uh, Eddington continued to support and help publicize Einstein's theory of relativity, which then got it generally accepted by the scientific community. Um, but the other thing he did was he correctly postulated in 1920 that it was nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium that kept the sun burning and held it up against the pressure of gravity. So, you know, it, it's, uh, that was before his time. Uh, Einstein had only just written his works um, and uh, his uh, um, th theories that showed that E was equal to mc squared and um, that if hydrogen and helium fused then you were going to get a lot of energy from a little amount of mass so that that was what uh, eddington hit on in 1882 uh, in eight, 1920 sorry <clears throat> and then we get further ahead and this time it's hubble and um, it was, first of all, that using Henrietta Leavitt's Cepheid variables, Hubble actually measured M31 and at, 
being at a distance of 900,000 light years, which at the time was far outside of our own galaxy. Um, so that was, um, you know, on the back of Henrietta Leavitt's work. Um, and the, then in 1929, Hubble um, no, noticed that most of the galaxies were receding away from us at a rate proportional to their distance, which then became known as Hubble's law. Um, and this is actually the plate, a photograph obviously of the plate that um, Hubble, Hubble had actually spotted this Cepheid variable. And he actually scribbled on the photographic plate. So um, good job they didn't want to see anything else that's below his writing there. But uh, yeah, so um, that's where we then began to realize that the um, universe was far bigger than just our galaxy. Um, and one has to ask really, was it pure coincidence that the confection of Mars launched the Milky Way chocolate bar in 1923 that has been expanding everyone's waistline ever since? So maybe there's a, a bit of a link there anyway. Now, um, Fritz Zwicky, absolute genius, but um, so eccentric that uh, uh, he was pretty much shunned by mainstream academia. But as you can see there, the, he, he predicted neutron stars and he predicted those just a year after neutrons had been discovered. Um, in 1933 also, he, he said he was measuring the coma cluster and um, the rotation of the galaxies around the center of mass. And he's, he realized that the, the rate of um, revolution of that cluster could not be explained by just what could be seen as visible matter. And so um, that's where he proposed that there must be dark matter out there that we just couldn't see. In 1934, he, he predicted that supernova existed. Nobody had actually, they'd probably seen them, but not known what they were. And he actually described what would cause a supernova. And also he proposed gravitational lensing as well. And um, so very, very clever bloke. And this was in, in 1937. Um, excuse me, I'll just get a drink. And if you notice the um, uh, picture on the right hand side there, this is quite interesting. I only discovered this um, picture a few days ago, actually. And they're saying that that dark ring around the uh, galaxies in the center is actually where dark matter must be located. And they've calculated this by looking at the distortion of the galaxies in the center caused by the gravitational force of the dark matter that must be there. So uh, be interesting to see later on whether that, that's correct. Um, then we step it up in size now on the telescopes. Um, we have the 200 inch Mount Palomar Hale, Hale Telescope. Um, and that uh, was actually supposed to have a Richie Cretian design of mirrors to give it a wider field of view without optical errors. However, an argument uh, between Hale and Richie resulted in Richie walking off the job and being fired, or being fired rather. Uh, I couldn't find out when I did my research, I couldn't find out whether he was actually fired or whether he just walked off the job. So the 200 inch hail is the largest and last professional telescope with a parabolic mirror set. But our, at MCAS, we have the GP20 and that's actually a 20 inch 
and it's a, a Richie Cretian design. So we're looking forward to finally getting that commissioned. Now, also, I don't know whether any of you have heard uh, the, about the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which is due to come online um, in the 20s. Um, but that has been named um, for Vera Cooper Rubin. And she actually discovered by measuring uh, orbital speeds uh, of stars around their galaxy center, they didn't decline um, with, with distance as they would have done if you were just um, using Newton's and Kepler's laws. Um, so this required a large amount of unseen matter around the galaxy, so-called dark matter, which supported the theory of dark matter initially proposed by Fritz Zwicky in 1933. However, at the time, Vera was open-minded and said, I don't know if we have dark matter or need a change in gravity or need something else. So she was... Um, she left the door open there, really, to um, the MOND theory, the, the Modified Newtonian Dynamics Theory of Gravity. Um, so it will be interesting to see which one of those works out to be correct in the long run. But it, the um, telescope to be installed in the Vera C. Rubin Observatory is actually um, the biggest camera ever made. Uh, and it's made up of uh, 189 individual sensors. Um, and they've, ju they've just recently done the camera test on that. And they're, they're shipping it, or it might actually be there now, uh, shipping it to the telescope, which is in northern Chile. Uh, but the, the actual mechanics of the telescope have been delayed slightly due to COVID. <clears throat> so... Now, of course, we all know about the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, after the initial launch of the HST, there was, of course, immense disappointment when they found the mirror was incorrectly figured and could not focus on anything. However, the 1993 Space Shuttle Endeavour was sent to catch Hubble to load it into the cargo bay, where astronauts spent five days fixing it. And boy, what a great job they did. I think we all have to agree on that. <clears throat> and here's some of the, the absolute, um, I think, the, well, these two here, they were the two that really impressed me the most of the Hubble images from you know, a few years ago. Those two, absolutely incredible. <clears throat> what I found incredible was the very fine filigree up here that you can see as well as the large scale fingers uh, of the pillars of creation. Um, and this is, uh, or still is, I think, the, the biggest ground-based telescope at the moment, 10.4 meters, single aperture, um, multi-segmented, uh, but single aperture. Um, and that's me beside one of the um, uh, uh, segments from the, uh, the Grand Telescope, the Grand Tacan. Uh, it looks brown because it's actually reflecting the wooden ceiling of the uh, canteen that we we're in at the time. So the future, getting ever bigger, basically. Um, so, and you can see they they have had some delays, um, but. Uh, we're, we're looking at commissioning dates and first light dates of some of those in the late 20s. So that should be interesting to see how those come on. And this little graphic just gives you an idea of the scale of the mirrors on some of these uh, existing and proposed uh, telescopes. Um, and noting the red box at the, at the lower left, um, that's showing some of the larger space telescope mirrors. But as you can see, all the big ones are all multifaceted. This is an interesting one, the giant Magellan 
because it's using round rather than hexagonal segments. Now, this, I have only just seen this, but this is a prediction of what we're going to be up against with satellites that are due to be launched in the next 10 years. And this has been put together by Dr. T.S. Kelso of Celestrack. And what he's done is he's looked at all of the applications for radio bandwidth from satellites um, where they've applied to get this radio bandwidth. And when they're uh, allotted the radio bandwidth, they have to take it up within seven years Otherwise, they, they get capped at where they are by after seven years. They can't, they can't have any more. And if you look at all that lot, you know, it's, ah, it, it, this blew my mind when I saw this. And I thought, ah, oh, you know, because um, I can see some problems there. And that, that you, can, you can watch that visualization uh, a bit slower. I sp had to speed it up for our presentation tonight. But you can watch that at agi.com. Oh, not that. And this, this shows you what it can do to large professional telescopes. Uh, and this is just um, with the um, Starlinks constellation. We haven't got any of the, those other constellations up yet because most of them Although it the, the, the started in 2019, obviously with COVID and that, we've been a bit delayed there. So the only ones we've got up there really at the moment are the, is the Starlink constellation. But of course, we're going to have one web, which the British government uh, is supporting. And, uh, you know, this madness needs to be stopped. And I would hope that <coughs> all serious astronomers get onto their MPs to um, try and prevent any more of this happening. Because, um, you know, the, the sky after all is a site of special scientific interest. And it's also an area of outstanding natural beauty. So w it should be protected. So question time. What do all the previous slides have in common? Anybody? Unmute. And, and have a guess. We're in the past. <laughs> um, no, the big big telescopes one wasn't. No, the the answer is actually they're all visible light, all invisible light. So we've obviously got a much wider spectrum to play with, um, and so going to look at a couple of those um, now and this is here the various radio dishes and of course we, with um, the Rayleigh criterion um, we know that <coughs> you've got to have bigger diameters of receivers to get the same resolution if you've got a lower frequency um, uh, electromagnetic wave so therefore um you know we the the big ones to get the high resolution radio dishes have to be very big um and and with small smaller shorter wavelengths the microwave we can get away with smaller ones and this is uh the horn antenna uh, with in 1964 uh penzias and wilson where they detected the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation after they'd ruled out the fact that it wasn't pigeon poo in the uh, horn antenna. Um, and the, the image below is an all sky picture of the cosmic microwave background uh, created from nine years of Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe data. Uh, the WMAP data. And the image actually reveal, reveals 13.77 billion year old temperature fluctuations. Um, so um, 
the signals in there, the signals from our own galaxy have been subtracted, which is why you don't see a, a bright band going across it. In 1978, Penzias and Wilson were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. But also we, we had our own radio um, observatories um, at that time. And um, one of them was the uh, Interstellar Scintillation Array up at Cambridge. Um, and it was actually physically put together by a team of um, volunteers under the supervision of Jocelyn Bell. And um, it was Jocelyn um, who was uh, reading all the data charts that were coming off the telescope, the radio telescope. Um, and as it says on the slide, two months into her observations, Bell became aware of a bit of scruff, as she called it. And the scruff was a series of pulses equally spaced and always 1.337 seconds apart. Um, and she's, she actually went in print as saying that she was very annoyed trying to get a PhD out of a new technique. And some silly lot of little green men had to choose my aerial and my frequency to communicate with us. But, but I, um, what she had actually discovered was the first pulsar um, located in Volpecula, I found out the other day. Um, so going even bigger, square kilometer array. Um, this will require more than three times the supercomputer capacity of the Large Hadron Collider and generate an unimaginable amount of data. Just imagine what would happen to our download speeds if they tried to push that lot down the internet. Let's hope they don't use the same computer experts that tried to digitize the UK's national health records a few <laughs> years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and also um, going out into space allows us to see some of these frequencies that we can't see um, through our atmosphere. And um, so this particular satellite, the SWIFT satellite, can locate gamma ray bursts sufficiently accurately to pass the information to ground-based telescopes for them to swing round and lock onto the object within minutes of first detection. There is a group of ground-based telescopes that have agreed to drop everything and search for the source of these GRBs as soon as they get the notification from SWIFT. Um, and short duration gamma ray bursts are thought to come from massive object mergers like binary neutron stars merging. Um, and long duration gamma ray bursts are thought to come from truly massive stars undergoing type 1c core collapse. Uh, so supernovae, hypernovae, possibly creating a black hole. And um, so these are three of the um, best known, I suppose, uh, space telescopes. Uh, the Spitzer Infrared launched in 2003, but that ran out of coolant in 2009 and went on to do a warm mission, which ended in 2020. The Chandra X-ray launched in 1999 and is still ongoing in 2021. And the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope was launched 2008 and currently planned to operate to 2022. So not, not uh, far in the future there. But this is one of my other mind blowing images that I have seen from NASA and, Hubble and the Hubble team. When I looked at this, I thought, oh my God, you can actually see the neutron star in the middle of that swirling space around it. I mean, that's, that's what it looks like to me. It pre presumably isn't that, but it just looks like that. And they've done that by combining the Chandra X-rays with the Hubble visible and the Spitzer infrared. And that, as I say, is probably the, th the third um, most awe-inspiring picture I've seen from NASA and Hubble and Co.
So, what's next? The James Webb Space Telescope, as you probably are all aware of, it's due to, oh, I've missed that. <laughs> the updated launch date is not November 2021. It's actually the 18th of December 2021. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, it's got a primary mirror diameter of 6.5 metres, secondary mirror 0.74 metres, 18 mirror segments, each weighing 1.32 flat to flat. Uh, three different figurings, interestingly, they've got three different figurings of the mirror segments. Um, and that's presumably, I don't know whether they've got servo actuators behind them. I've, I've not been able to find that out yet. But um, <clears throat> that would normally be what uh, would be used to get those all into alignment. But uh, they definitely are using three different figurings uh, on the mirrors. Um, so that, as I say, is now planned to launch in uh, December, on December the 18th. Um, but they do have several options for the launch window. So if they miss that one, there are others coming up behind it. So that will be parked at the Lagrange L2 point, as shown on the diagram there. Um, and uh, it will actually produce... Um, orbit in a Lissajou figure around the L2 point. Um, and the JWST cooling system is a closed circuit design, so in theory should not run out. Uh, the JWST carries enough fuel for greater than five and a half years, with a goal of 10 years, hopefully. And this is just me doing a little a uh, simple illustration here of why infrared is so good. Um, when, when you see it in visual, then you, know, you, you can see the lack of resolution there. But when you put it into a black plastic bag, then that's why infrared is so good. Because so much of our galaxy is filled with clouds of interstellar dust and gas that are opaque to visible light and obscure our view of what's behind the clouds. Whereas with infrared, we'll be able to see through them. And this is just a, a comparison that uh, I found, um, which shows the Hubble ultra deep field and compares that to the simulated JWST image. And down at the bottom there, the, the graphic there just shows you how much further they're expected to be able to see with the JWST because, because it, 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 it's got a larger mirror, but it's using a lower frequency. So its resolution is probably going to be about the same as the Hubble. But, and, and it, uh, it has got a much bigger collecting area. So therefore it is going to be much more sensitive than the Hubble infrared cameras. So what are these, all these previous slides still have in common? Any, any offers? All very quiet. Are you still there? You're not we are still here. <laughs> I'll come back to that after we've had a look at this launch of the JWST Space Telescope. Hope you all uh, can see this video coming up. So I hope you all enjoyed that. I, I found it absolutely incredible. Um, but one of the, one of the absolute uh, you know, things that I'm, Oh, I, I, I can't explain how I feel about it, but how likely is it that everything is going to work correctly? There's so much in there that could go wrong. <clears throat> when, we, when we went to um, the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, um, or no, we didn't actually get there because of COVID, but we, we're part of the AstroBoost team, which is uh, organised by the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. 
And we were supposed to meet with some of the engineers that had built um, the MIRI instrument, which goes on the James Webb Space Telescope. But we, we had a chat with them over Zoom. And one of them was saying that they'd been told that they could have no moving parts in the MIRI instrument or you know, virtually no moving parts because they didn't want anything to go wrong. Then you see that lot and you think, oh, my God. And of course, there's no way of fixing it. It's it, it's not a Hubble. You can't go up and fix it. So let's hope it all goes right. Um, so, uh, as I say, who are they trying to kid? So what do all those previous slides still have in common? Anybody like to unmute and give me an answer? Electromagnetic radiation. The man's on the ball. The man is on the ball. Yep, that's right. Uh, yeah, well done, Peter. Thank you. So what's left? Hey, Joe. Sorry? Sorry? Uh, radio? Uh, radio? No, we we did the radio, and that's electromagnetic. No, the gravitational oh, waves. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> gravitational waves. That's right. Uh, as predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity, um, yeah, the potential sources for the signals include merging supermassive black holes at the centre of galaxies, um, and uh, also black holes orbited by smaller compact objects um, and I'll, I'll go over that in a in a minute but first of all this was actually although we we heard about the detection of the first gravitational wave in 2016 and it was actually detected in 2015 as I'll come on to in a minute but um, before then these two guys Russell Hulse and Joseph Hooten Taylor Jr had looked at uh, a binary star system with a pulsar and a neutron star orbiting each other. And they could see that their orbits were decaying. And why would they decay if they're in free space? Well, the reason that they were decaying was because they were giving off energy as gravitational waves. And when they plotted it all out uh, and calculated it all out, that absolutely can, um, agreed with Einstein's theories of the gravitational waves. So that was the first time that there was proof that there were gravitational waves really. And they won the Nobel Prize for that in 1993. But since then, the race for gravitational waves has been on. And the first one, the LIGO detectors, there was, there's two of them. Um, <coughs> Uh, that are located over 3,000 kilometers apart at uh, Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana. Um, and first of all, they didn't detect anything. And then they thought, well, actually, we might need to make them a lot more sensitive. And so they took them down and did a lot of engineering work on them and then started them up again on the 18th of September 2015. They're now called the Advanced LIGOs. Um, and as I, you see on the slide there, they're measuring a change in distance of one ten thousandth the width of a proton. <laughs> Again, this is something that I just, I just cannot imagine how you can do that. But anyway, they can and they do. But also to do that, they've got to hold the what they call test masses or mirrors, very, very, um, keep, sorry, keep them very isolated from any sort of tremor or um, earthquake or anything like that. And they've got a very, very sophisticated system as shown there in the bottom right-hand picture. And these test masses are at the ends of two um, four kilometer long arms. Uh, and the idea is that because the arms are in an L shape, when a gravitational wave comes along, it will shorten one arm and lengthen the other. 
um and so by yeah by and therefore double the detection um sensitivity basically but um that's been going now for quite a long time and um in september 2015 just after just after they'd got both the hanford and the louisiana um systems back up online with the new uh, improved instrumentation and engineering it wasn't long before they found gravity wave 150914 which was a, they attribute to a solar mass black hole merger uh, both black holes about 29 and 36 solar masses so and they reckon it was about 1.3 billion light years away with a peak power output 50 times that of the entire visible universe you just you know the, these these um, energy levels are absolutely immense and then there was but i don't think yes it was no it wasn't i don't think that one was actually de detected by both LIGO and Virgo, because by, by that time, Virgo is, is another one, very similar to LIGO, um, and it's located near Pisa in Italy. And the idea is getting a longer baseline, like we do with radio telescopes, etc. They were going to get longer baselines. And um, there's a detector called CAGRA um, that's coming where it has already started taking data on in 2020. But at the moment, the LIGO detectors are down for engineering work. And, but in 2022, which is operational period four, um, all three, the advanced, two advanced LIGO, oh, all four, sorry, because it's two advanced LIGO, LIGOs, the advanced Virgo and CAGRA, they will all be online uh, in 2022, uh, 2022. So they're expecting great results from that. <coughs> and it was actually quite interesting because when I first gave this talk, I was talking about all these detectors uh, and uh, uh, gravitational waves, etc. cetera. Uh, unbeknown to me at that time, because it was January, 2016, Unbeknown to me at that time, LIGO had already detected its first gravitational wave, uh, which was the 14th of September 2015. And interestingly, that is exactly 100 years after Einstein predicted their existence in his theory of gen general relativity. So I'd just like to run this. And that, of course, is the chirp, is the frequency shifted signal of a gravitational wave hitting the detectors. And this is a, a sky map uh, of the uh, waves, the gravitational waves they've detected so far. And as you'll see, it could be in one of two different places, um, you know, diametrically opposed. Um, places within the uh, universe so uh, at the moment they can't narrow it down precisely but they're hoping that once CAGRA comes online uh, then they might be able to do that so that would be very interesting because then people will be able to well um, tell it you know, the big optical telescopes will be able to instantly swing round and look at that position in the sky to see what they can see um, the, the Kagra one, which is in, the, in Japan, is very interesting because it's got two tunnels, 200 meters below ground to reduce seismic noise. They're only three kilometer long, the arms on the Kagra one, but they have cryogenically cooled the mirrors to reduce atomic vibrations, actually introducing signals into the system. 
So they're trying to stop the atoms in the mirror um, and, and, and reduce the noise caused by those. And uh, as I say, that will be operational with the LIGO and Virgo in uh, 2022. And the next generation gravitational wave detectors are space-based ones. They're on the drawing boards already. And in fact, we've already had a test of the LISA uh, system. They had a small test system, uh, which was launched in, on the 3rd of December, 2015, to actually make sure that they could position the test masses that were free floating inside the satellite um, whether they could actually uh, position them and detect them and uh, work out their positions accurately enough um, for the full scale LISA, um, which uh, is, I, I did look this up to find out when they were thinking 2034 is the planned uh, launch date for the full scale LISA. And LISA will have um, very, very long arms, 2.5 million kilometer long arms. But that, that gives its own problem as well, because everything's moving. Uh, they're going to have to launch the lasers 8.5 seconds ahead of the receiving um, one of the three satellites. So, and that satellite then has to ping the laser beam back another uh, 8.3 seconds ahead of the receiver. Uh, so it's all, all quite interesting this. Uh, it'd be, be interesting to see how they do that. But gravitational waves are obviously the big thing. Um, and uh, yeah, how fantastic that Einstein predicted them a hundred years ago. And now with our modern technology, we've been able to demonstrate that he was absolutely correct. So the most massive binary, black hole merger uh, occurred in uh, 2019 um, and uh, it, it, there were two quite big black holes and they, but when they merged, they left 142 solar mass black hole. That meant that eight solar masses of energy had gone missing or eight solar masses of mass had been converted into energy. So this is where you see that figure for outshining the whole of the uh, observable universe because that's an enormous amount of energy and of course it's released within a second so it, it's absolutely um, phenomenal so if i've whetted your appetite for gravitational waves you can all go online uh, einstein at home and uh, you can volunteer. It's uh, one of these distributed computing projects that searches for signals from rotating neutron stars, gamma ray pulsars, etc. And in fact, um, they, when I was looking through the results uh, yesterday, the most recent results, there are several there that have been uh, uh, ag uh, acknowledged as being detected by the Einstein at home network so that's really good so you might even get your name on a gravitational wave so what do all the previous slides still have in common anybody please quick 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 i think catherine was saying something but she's muted so they're all to do with waves ian yes the actual thing i'm thinking of is they all observe remotely. We're observing what's going on millions of light years ago. So what's left? Manned exploration, of course. And we had the Apollos in 69 to 72. Mars is on the cards for a manned exploration. Um, you know, um, NASA's current aim is in the 20. 2030s, middle of the 2030s, but Elon Musk's SpaceX have a hopeful date of 2024 and a confident date of 2026, and that's published on their website. Anyone want tickets? 
No. <laughs> well, if you want a ticket, I'm sure he'll, he'll be able to let you have one. Um, and then unmanned space exploration, of course, and we've got examples there of quite a few that have already been off places and, and brought samples back. Um, and of course, Perseverance is busy on Mars digging up samples and popping them into canisters for a later sample collection visit um, at some stage in the future. I couldn't find an update on that, couldn't get any sort of uh, indication of what date that would be. So thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. As I say, as much as I hoped, as I enjoyed researching it, and um, I hope you weren't bored with it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. That's all Can right. I ask you to um, stop sharing your screen? I hope I have. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Ian, for a uh, fascinating talk. A really, really quick whiz through uh, yeah. well, astronomy is, uh, and, yeah, and the rest sorry. of it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Paul. It, you know, no, no, to, 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 to do it any justice, to do these people any justice, you could spend a week on it, you know, still not touch everybody. Uh, you, certainly, you certainly can. Uh, so we're looking for uh, questions. Um, a digital hand, please. Uh, first. Uh, just going back to the, uh, the gravitational waves, uh, mm -hmm. the thought occurred to me that the... Um, uh, the uh, the release of energy by the biggest eight eight uh, solar masses yes. released by that explosion yes. or that merger. Uh, yeah, it. We're always taught that nothing gets away from a black hole. <laughs> so what's yes. the mechanism? Well, it must it, come away from the event horizon, like Hawking radiation, but it must be coming from the event horizon just as the two merge presumably I, but, I, but the event horizon and the black hole are not the same thing that's a good point yeah okay yeah. i'll have to i'll have to look into that further i hadn't actually thought about that yeah presumably um gravitational waves travel at the speed of light do they yes yeah and they're transverse waves they're not longitudinal waves like light waves the transverse. Well, that that's something to think about. Uh, I've got Trevor Worrell uh, <laughs> all the way from Spain. Trevor, can you unmute yourself, please? Evening, Ian. Hi, Trevor. Interesting presentation. Um, it's just two questions that's at the back of my mind, and um, I guess you know people are going to be talking about them all the time. The first is restarling and the fact. What would have happened if these swarms were up there when uh, this uh, new mission had gone up? God only knows. I know it's a big place up there in space, but uh, surely the chances of um, uh, future missions being uh, hit by some space debris. Yeah, and and and, and the satellites. Yes, because that that simulation I showed just showed you satellites, not space debris. Yeah, and a figure I saw um recently said they think they reckon there's about a million bits of space debris out there now i don't know where they get a million from that seemed very high to me but mm. that's the sort of level they're talking about and only uh two days ago the iss had to do an emergency maneuver to get out of a the way of an incoming um you know and and that's not the first time it's had to do that yeah, I think, is it uh, the uh, Starlink swarm might be, a, when it when it finishes deployment, is going to be about 40,000 units. And then you've got your Amazon and all your others. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it just seems like a bit of a nightmare for someone trying to plot a course through that lot. Yeah, well, you know, and it, 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 it's not just that. And, and, you know, obviously the satellites themselves are, you know, people are monitoring all this and allocating the orbits and everything else to keep them well apart from each other. Yeah. But you can just see this happening, can't you? One hits another one, showers off debris, which hits another one, a big chain oh, yeah. reaction, yeah. big chain reaction. Yeah. Uh, but 
my so, biggest concern, sorry, my biggest concern is how the hell are we going to do any astronomy from the ground? Yeah. It's bad enough now. I, I should think every, I don't know, every fifth or sixth subframe of mine of more than four or five minutes duration has got satellite trail in it. Yeah. There's people falling against it on on various social platforms like Facebook. You can argue all day that some think it's better to put internet into the middle of South Africa than it is for amateur and professional astronomers to, uh, you know, go un, unhindered. Yeah. Sorry to take the time up, but the other one was, and it, it's close to my heart, you know, the man flights to various um, planets. Mm. Um, isn't it time to start thinking about our own Earth and getting that sorted out? You, 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 you and I think that think alike on all this trevor mm -hmm. i can see that um but going back to that thing about having internet in the middle of africa um okay so you put a cable in to several big aerials and you beam it out on 5g what's wrong with that you know yeah um and to say that they've got to have it and and but the other thing is there are so many different networks that are registering to provide or, or, you know, presumably to do a similar service. So, no, we have one Starlinks that we've got to put up with. Why have we now got to go and launch OneWeb? OneWeb is the Indian network that was uh, that had gone bankrupt. And I, I jumped for joy when I saw that. But now the British government has bailed it out. So it's still going to launch. <coughs> so, okay. yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. No, that's all right, Trevor. No, nice to talk to you. Okay. Well, Ian Musk, Ian Musk has to be careful, otherwise there would be so much, many of his own satellites out there with Starlink, he won't be able to launch his SpaceX mission to Mars. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> he's, he's got to leave a bit of a window, isn't he? <laughs> Thank you for that comment, Gary. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. Um, and last night, on a Tuesday night, I was watching the uh, Pop Astro Live done by the Society for Pop Astronomy, and Ian Morrison was giving a talk, and he mentioned about gravitational waves, mm -hmm. and he was saying that what he thinks could be really exciting with them, I mean, he was, he was actually very excited about gravitational waves, but what he was saying was, uh, with the Big Bang, because at the very start, you had had all these ionized, all these ions going around. That there were um, the light couldn't pass it, but with the gravitational waves, you can do, and you can go much further back into the origins of the Big Bang. Yeah, well, obviously, um, mm. I can't remember now how long after the Big Bang they reckon that the first baryonic matter formed. You know, the first electrons and, and protons and things like that. Mm -hmm. um it it was quite a while after wasn't it i've got a fi figure in my head of about 300 million years or something i might be totally wrong with that so don't quote me on that but yes so before then we we're not going to see any light because no light was emitted so um because it couldn't get through well it was emitted i suppose but it, it couldn't get through the, the fog um, so yes, uh, gravitational waves. Then um, they, yeah, I think that sounds like quite a, a good idea, you know, a feasible idea. I, I mean, I'm not an expert in gravitational waves. I just like looking into these things as an inter interested astronomer. I'm not, I'm not a PhD or anything. So um, you know. Uh, Ian Morrison would know more about that than I would. So, yeah, but interesting. Thank you. Hey, Ian, I've, I've got a question for you. Well, it's not a question, a comment. Yeah. Going back to going back to Ptolemy, he's yeah. one of my favourite astronomers. I've got his Almagest, the, uh, a British uh, conversion, uh, oh, right. so I can read it. Yeah. And a lot of people give him stick for saying that the uh, solar system's a, a geocentric system. Now, in his book, I can't find, I've not read it from cover to cover yet, but right. I'm working my way through it. Right. But he doesn't actually say that the Earth is the centre 
of of the of the system we live in. He, he, he actually says that it doesn't matter whether we have a heliocentric or a geocentric system for his observations. His book isn't philosophical. No. It, it's like a guide to observing the, the heavens mm. from the earth, mm. if you see what I'm, yeah, what yeah. I'm trying to say. Because right. what he was trying to do is measure measure the heavens, the fixed location of the fixed stars, and the movement of the planets, and that, and, and also describe the equipment he used. And also, what I really find fantastic is that his measurements are accurate to like one sixth of a degree or forty arc seconds, right. and it's really, really consistent with that as well. And it, so it amazes me what time mechanism he actually used to work all that out but it but, but it's accurate it's consistent and uh, it's a really good read <laughs> yeah well how would he do that because they hadn't invented clockwork clocks by then well it? people say they use these egyptian uh, water clocks and things but i'll tell you what there's there's some stuff we really don't know, I know. Uh, I know. there's some things that they did we don't know and, and 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 I've compared some of the I can put it some of the readings. I've it, there's like hundreds and hundreds of star readings. But if you if you compare if you plot the, the stars as they are today against these two thousand years ago, they are extremely similar. <laughs> so so it, it's consistent. It's, it's very very consistent. So they must have had some accurate time system. I don't know what it was. Yeah. It, yeah. For some reason, it doesn't describe. His timepiece. He just describes his equipment, uh, how he, how they built it, and what they used, hmm. which right. is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Could it be it was a shadow stick, Phil? <laughs> Not, what in the dark? <laughs> <laughs> okay, th thanks for that, Phil. Uh, Pete, Welcome. Pete Jarowalski has been waiting very patiently. Yeah, I'm uh, very anyone angry. Near this, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, and just one question. Uh, what's the resolving power of the telescopes on the ground? The, well, I mean, the new ones that are projected compared to the James Webb telescope. Uh, obviously, you've got the uh, blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere. I noted that the telescopes on the ground will have several times the yes. power, but despite that, I presume James Webb will have no doubt still have an advantage. Just wondered. Uh, James Webb will have an advantage, definitely, because it's up up in space, yeah. obviously. I'm just trying to get out of this so I can go back to that uh, particular slide. Um, the wait. atmosphere will absorb some of the uh, certain, uh, certain uh, electromagnetic radiation. But, I mean, it's not that. Uh, I meant it's perhaps the blurring effect. Suppose which reduces the resolving power. Yeah, but they've all got adaptive optics and everything yeah. else, the latest yeah. gizmos on them. And I, I'm struggling to find somewhere I had in my presentation, maybe I took it out. I probably took it out. Did I? Uh, can, can I just put in a little note here? Um, uh, because infrared, the sort of infrared uh, part of the spectrum is a uh, sort of much longer wavelength then you don't get as, as good resolving power with an infrared detector as you do, say, with a visual detector, simply because the waves are spread out over a larger area. Yeah. So they're not, they're not really comparable in that sense. No, but the, uh, I, did me I did mention about the Rayleigh criteria that sets that, doesn't it? And because the mirror is so much bigger, you know, it's three times the size, so you can go up to three times longer wavelength um, and still have oh. the sta same resolving power. But because it's got a much larger dish than the Hubble uh, infrared mm. cameras, then, or, or the Hubble telescope, sorry, because it's got a much larger um, mirror, then it will be receiving more photons and therefore you, it will be, uh, uh, able to see fainter objects so um, they're saying that it will be better than Hubble uh, because Hubble's only got uh, it's quite a small um, or uh, it, I think it's quite a low resolution as well infrared camera I'm not sure on that but 
they, they're saying it's going to be better than Hubble in infrared anyway. And it goes further into the infrared, <laughs> much further into the infrared. So therefore, we'll be able to look at these red shifted galaxies <laughs> further back than Hubble can see. Yeah. For um, me, it's a particularly of interest because uh, infrared means brown dwarfs. That's an area of mine. Particularly oh, interesting. Right. You never know. It could be a, there could be a brown dwarf. I don't know in the further reaches of our solar system, or I mean, particularly between or closer than Proxima Centauri. But you never know. Hmm. Right. Okay. Well, let me drag you your the screen down here, so I'm not looking up all the time. Oh, uh, and yeah, no, that's true. And and I was trying to find out what the uh, first targets they they will be actually um, focusing on with the web um, and they were all the reports I could find was saying that they are waiting the results of the uh, round of bids for observing time um, so I couldn't find out exactly what they would be focusing on and when uh, I'm sure they will be looking at brown dwarfs but wh whether they're looking at brown dwarfs in in our galaxy uh, solar system or it, you know it probably just be in our galaxy i suppose i don't know there's a look out to uh, uh about 100 parsecs usually what the team i'm involved in they look out to those distances but usually if it's up to, up to 100 parsecs then they usually detect l dwarfs right. which are just a bit below m class stars uh, much closer in. Uh, I don't think at that at 100 parsec distances they can't detect Y dwarfs and T dwarfs because they're just too dim. So perhaps with the uh, uh, James Webb telescopes they'll be able to uh, yeah yeah detect that. Well, your your network might know a bit more about it than I yeah. do. So yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, Tony Morris, can you unmute yourself, Tony? Yeah, well, I'm you. just uh, just uh, thinking what. What Peter said and what Ian said about the, the resolution. So, so telescopes like the VLT, uh, underneath the four VLT units, there's, there's actually a, a big tunnel. And in that tunnel, they can actually combine the light mm -hmm. from all the units there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think it only that only works at the lower end. Uh, of the, the frequency spectrum for what the visible light, the VLT, can see. But at, at those spatial frequencies, and I think it's a 100-metre baseline for the VLT, right. between Unit 1 to Unit 4, it can easily out-resolve Hubble. Can it? Yeah. yeah. So, so that's using laser guide stars. So yeah. that's scintillation in the, in the sodium layer. Uh, and then deconvoluting the the image through supercomputers effectively yeah yeah right okay thank you for that yeah interesting okay uh just going back to your galileo uh, your newton quote about standing on the shoulders of uh giants giants um, before him yeah, yeah uh, a lot of people now uh see that as uh as Newton having a uh, a poke at Robert Hooke, because Robert they? Hooke was quite short. In actual, <laughs> fact, in actual fact, Newton was a bit of a plagiarist because it was uh, it was a quote by a uh, philosopher in eleven thirty, I think, uh, Bernard of Chartres, who first who first said, uh, "I'm going to." Well, it wasn't it. it wasn't exactly the same though, was it? Uh, we are like, this is Bernard of Chartreau's quote, we are oh, like right. dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants mm. and are so able to see more and see further than the ancients. Right, okay. Pretty damn quote, the co uh, close. Yeah. So, uh, but if it's... I, a, I'll, I'll need to add him into my, in, into my slideshow then. Uh, if, it, if it's worth, uh, if it's a good quote and it's, yeah. worth, it's worth stealing. <laughs> uh, that's it. Uh, ladies and gents, I'm looking for questions. Um, I'm not seeing any more. So I think, uh, oh, no, Tony, uh, Tony Morris wants to have a, a word again. Just, wants... just going back to so, uh, there's been a few uh, articles about uh, the effect of the low Earth satellite internet 
swarms that we're going to have. Uh, and the, the astronomers that are the most worried ones are the ones that are looking for transient events. Mm. So if, if the astronomers are doing deep space, long exposure stuff, uh, they're expecting uh, techniques to come from the AI world where they can get rid of the streaks. I don't, I don't know why they just can't stack them and do them like we do. Uh, but they're saying it's going to be really difficult for looking for inbound uh, lumps of rock and, yes. and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, well, that Vera C. Rubin uh, Observatory, that's one of that, its jobs mm. is to look for inbound stuff and transient events. It's, it's a big, it's got a three, I think it was a three and a half degree field of view. And it's going to sweep the sky in the whole sky or the, where is it? It's in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and it's North Chile, so it'll get up to the Northern Hemisphere a fair way. Uh, and it's supposed to be looking for inbounds and also uh, transient events. Um, and yeah, this is, as you say, it's going to give them a real problem. Get a, get a satellite zip across the field and you've got a transient. So, and I do, when I was looking at this, I'm, there is now... Um, I've, I've noticed there are people out there um, promoting software to remove these satellite trails from images, you know, for us, for us to use. Um, but if you're actually doing serious scientific um, observation, then you don't want to be messing with that picture. You don't want to be tampering with the picture to get rid of satellite trails. Because you don't know what else you might be getting getting rid of, and yeah, it's. Well, it, I think it'd be interesting, Ian, because you know the professionals would have calibration frames of that area. So how the hell do you do a calibration frame when every few seconds you're going to have some third party object was in through? Yeah, it? yeah, because that that one I showed you, uh, I can't get to it at the moment, but that that picture I showed you, there was about twelve trails going across the the imaging sensor um and so yeah and it's only going to get worse that's at the moment that was a live image that had been taken and that's just with the starlings so when you get everybody else's and my argument is why do you need another one oh well it's for competition yeah okay so uh, maybe that's why the government's jumped on board the Indian one. But we don't then need Amazon. We don't need all the others as well. And it's just because these companies are big enough and they, you know, these multi-trillion dollar companies want to make another trillion dollars. That's what it is. And I, 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 I just don't think it should be allowed because, you know, the, the celestial sphere is a site of special scientific interest. It's an area of outstanding natural beauty. We wouldn't get planning permission to put a house in there, would we? You know, uh, but the, these massive great companies just seem to be able to ride roughshod over everybody. Well, I, I think the other thing is, Ian, there's, there's internet nationalism. So if the Americans don't do it, the Chinese will do it. If Amazon doesn't do it, you know, Musk will do it. So the latest complaint about Musk's uh, submission is he's effectively put two submissions up to the uh, federal authorities yeah, in yeah. the States. And <clears throat> he's, he's kind of trying to block out the sky yeah. by his two swarms. And he's not saying which swarm he's going to use. No. So all the other people have kind of got to guess, unless like the Chinese are going to do their own thing anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well... Yeah, but what, if, what, where, you know, I mean, we're trying to protect our planet. Um, and as I, I, I don't, I can't remember whether I said it in there, but the one of the swarms of satellites, no, the IFU, I think it's the IFU, isn't it, that's linked with, um, uh, let me go back, I think it's the IFU that's linked with, um, the United Nations, they're now saying they've got to put them up because it's got to track climate change. 
you know, and so they're making an excuse for yet another swarm of satellites, you know, and it, where's it all going to end? There, there'll be, mm-hmm. there'll be no old, old bus paradox, will there? <laughs> no, no. You know, it will be bright wherever we look, you know, it's, it's hopeless really. Mm. Uh, sorry, but that's my view of it at the moment. They've got quite a big infrared signature as well. Yeah, and radio signature. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it was Dr. Megan Argo that uh, pre- provided me some of that material there after I saw her presentation the other week. And um, she was saying that because it, uh, they've been, you know, they've you know, uh, got the, uh, all, all the powers that be in the scientific community, to try and influence uh, the United Nations. But they're saying they can't do that. It's got to come from the ground level up through the politicians to put pressure on the United Nations. I'm not seeing anything. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, oh, no, you see, once again, I just get to the third hammer blow. And, uh, from Norfolk, it's Saturday night, it's Michael Poxon. Yeah, uh, just just a little bi- biographical note about uh, Sir Arthur Eddington. He yeah. is the father of Paul Eddington, uh, the actor who was in, I think it was Yes Minister. So that's sort of political, oh, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was. <laughs> and thank you for that, Michael. So, without further ado, what I we're going to do thinking. is... I uh, something. <laughs> Without further ado, we're going to say a big mix for to the Astronomical Society. Thank you to Ian Hargreaves. Ian, thank you for a wonderful evening. All right. Thank you very much.